नमस्कार विवेक वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन थैंक यू थैंक यू फॉर मेकिंग द टाइम सो विवेक वॉट इज योर अर्लीस्ट जी सॉरी I said it's an honor to be sitting across Rashmi Bakshi. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> the honor is mine. Um, so, Vivek, what is your earliest recollection of either the experience or the ideal of uh, non-violence of ahimsa? So, I mean, statutory warning is that I come from parts of the country uh, which experienced a lot of violence. You know. uh the punjab region uh, was where the you know from where the raids were happening in india i think uh, culturally speaking also i think uh, from a very reptilian you know surviving point of view it was not a hinsa i mean nowhere close uh also i think small peasantry that you know the class that we came from uh, from the lower shivalics uh i think uh, there was a need to survive uh and that need to survive was you know in continued till as you know late as maybe 20 years ago uh because accesses were you know tough difficult uh below the shivaliks was the fertile punjab which was you know going through uh green revolution and the new you know riches and we were kind of the poor country cousins but life changed for me and i think uh, you know my father when he finished his 10th in those days it used to be called matriculation so he got two jobs and i get goose pimples when i think about it after 10th he got the job of a tt and the job of a postman and he didn't take those jobs and he said i will go to the city and study so he was the first matriculate of his village the first graduate and then he you know joined the indian army as a commissioned officer and that's the that's how life changes for us uh and uh, left army early enough settled down in chandigarh chandigarh was you know the new nehruvian uh, idea of modernity uh, a a constellation of people from different parts of the country uh so for me you know i knew dosa and uttappa also because they were you know quote and quote madrasis around us i knew you know christmas and eid so it was a very interesting uh, location although it was completely patriarchal masculinity at its you know the the, the congregation of punjabis brought all the other aspects all this but what is interesting is that you know for me reading was natural in 75 i was 1975 as an 8 year old i used to cycle to a library which was 6 kilometers away and used to pick up two books so reading eight books a month i think somewhere uh, i would certainly attribute to that because uh, one read all the classics you know abridged lady bird versions i mean anything under the sky uh so that's one aspect but uh, i think the other aspect is of ahimsa for me definitely and i don't have any recollection beyond what i was you know reading about the history of uh, india's struggle for independence but i do not have a very specific uh, moment in life when i must have read uh, my experiments with uh but one lived reality was of ahimsa was that my father was a naturalist fauji the ab chandigarh was not inhabited by populations at time 70s and you know so saap nikalta tha we used to catch snakes you know there was i remember distinctly I remember cat stud a cat you know while she was delivering now you know that you know, down ho jata hai she couldn't and it was i remember it was like a very rainy night and papa and i were helping her and papa actually pulled the head out of of the kitten so there was a lot of those nature of things and you know snakes ab saap pakad liya marna nahi hai ab saap ko chhodne jana hai lake pe which may not happen today. so the saap used to be kept at home it used to be kept in those martman bazaar you know in the horlex bottles and we used to take out the snake in the evenings and take it for a walk and feed lizards to her so there was some nature of you know this uh, gerald darrells you know my family and other animals that famous book which i read much later so there was that nature of an engagement with uh, which was non violent 
at the same time you know when we went to the village my father's friends would create hunts and they would you know go hunting so it was a very it was a mishmash uh but i think uh, the first consciousness awakened uh i would say you know the train journeys and i mean i i i i have kind of you know my father said that the other beautiful thing was that you know sun travel uh so after the 11th empty year i used to be given a one way ticket and the other paisa for the other ticket used to be sewn in the west so that you know that money i saved for my return journey my first travel you know gt express delhi to madras i mean that time madras so you were how old sorry how old were you at this time uh 16 okay uh so you know in delhi i got into the train and there was an old woman and her grandchildren i gave them my middle birth i think and they gave me the top birth so in return i got to eat uh, curd rice but what is interesting is that in june that curd rice had turned putrid by the time we reached agra you know it used to be so hot and now what is very interesting is that you know the compartment train compartment is like a melting pot and i was sitting i i i i i couldn't uh, sit in the main compartment because that was a family unit so i used to sit on i was sitting on the aisle and i befriended this man who offered me food and there was a virtual riot in the uh, compartment because they said you will not eat his food because they understood the caste uh, complexities and they said he is a mochi because he said that he was trading in shoes uh so they inferred that he was a mochi and therefore i with his second name sharma brahmin i had to be saved from his food and my rational mind was you know i will eat his food i hated that old woman's curd rice because it was khatta and you know not to my palate but i loved i think it was a non veg uh and i ate with him and it was a kind of a you know it was a coming together of things and then i reached bangalore and i ate i went out on brigade road and looked i heard that beef was available in bangalore i ate beef just because i wanted to do what socially i was not allowed to and when i came back the beauty of my mother i told her that you know mom i had uh, beef and she said why did you have beef i mean there was a whole deep beef what is today called deep beef what we do in gandhi fellowship as a deep beef i said you know if i can have chicken then why can't i have beef and i was allowed that space and there was a conversation which mother initiated with my father that should we turn a vegetarian household of course it's a separate matter you know we didn't uh but the spaces i think these are the spaces now books took me to you want to also own a book as a child so the only you know cheap books that were available were russian i mean soviet books uh, so i ended up in punjab book center which had a collection of uh, these books that were available and i think i somehow landed on the communist manifesto but when i landed on the communist manifesto there was also a someone now chandigarh did not have political move except for the fact that i grew up during militants mm-hmm. so you know there was violence and my father and so the books so i'm saying the communist manifesto was probably of course there was i mean i'm very proud that i read midnight children as a 16 year old you know ayn rand's uh, fountain heads and all those books and lot of crap also by the way i mean uh, you know uh, but those books must have done something these travels did something The, the 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 thing that i am telling you is growing up militants now you know paramilitary was deployed for the first time in internal security and these paramilitary guys they had no understanding of how to deal with cultures rajni you won't believe it hamare sardar doston ke you know they used to the sikh friends they used to remove their turbans just to frisk them and we guys used to cry i mean we've had you know those nights where we drunk cheapest liquor played that you know music you remember tamas serial came uh, in those days yes. shiva var mohe shubh karmante kabhu na tarun 
you know jo lare teen ke het sura sohi you know all these guru gobind poetry used to play those you know that music at the loudest possible you know decibel dance and cry because it was such a it was it was the first interaction with violence uh we used to hit these crpf guys with hockeys because we wanted to get back at them that was that was our angst mm. and at home my father when you know this suddenly kps gail and ribero came and they were you know killing militants my father was like yes this is the way because my father had fought in the 60s the naga insurgents and he used to you know these army officers my father had sought early release from the army but these army officers used to pass by and they used to stop by for dinner and they used to dis, you know talk about how you know we we burnt naga villages and you know we did this and we did that because the nagas were also very aggressive uh you know warriors and indian army had lots of casualties so there were those stories there was this violence that we were experiencing and there was communist manifesto and you know these nature of conversations that was happening and then bulla ki jana mein kon you know those nature of poetry and pash saab you know uh aao chaliye udde ya baaja magar let's fly after these vultures that are you know uh yeah. i mean vulture yeah. analogy being what it is it's a very interesting melting pot mom i mean uh, phase uh, but uh, vivek in this uh, how did the violence against the innocents affect you because this is also the period when buses were being stopped on the highways uh, and hindus and sikhs were being separated and the hindus were being shot actually my first awareness of violence is also from that period because that is when when you sat in a bus in delhi a dtc bus the back of the seat in front of you said please check below your seat below your seats yeah if yeah. there is an unidentified object it may be a bomb etc alert the authorities yeah. so what did that do to you this random violence against innocent people see my 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 sense is that you know i think again this is the debt i owe to my you know the system the ecosystem in which i existed because we were i i grew up in a in a school which had majority six and that to jats uh so there was a there was a very strong interaction uh between hindus and six see i don't know if you remember even earlier than that there was a there was a plebiscite a language based plebiscite where hindus in punjab said you know our language is hindi and if you understand see lot of hindu families spoke hindi they did not speak punjabi my parents but i introduced punjabi because i grew up in a school i was sent to a school where you know we spoke punjabi so it is something that was happening which was creating this dialogue or this space for seeing violence as not an adequate process because we were strongly tied together our affinities are eating of out of the sick household or the sick children coming to my house did not stop so that bound that bind did not of course the uncles started to open their beards and there were moments you know i clearly remember and those shootings happened the ones that you mentioned you know for days people six did not talk to hindus we all used to carry a collective guilt but because we were you know living in these tangled kind of ecosystems where you know you had to professionally or otherwise engage uh, as adults and as children it didn't matter to us maybe you know it really didn't matter to us so i think that ana bana that warp and weft uh which is the you know which can be or which is now known as the the, the ganga jamuni but there is the bias satluj and the you know the i mean that that culture that uh, existed that togetherness was the was was the beauty of india yeah and therefore i think that fabric it held that stood uh, at that time and i i remember in the university you know like as a hindu boy hanging out with sick girls was a big no no 
I but see. my Sikh, yes, in Punjab University, there was a lot of problem. You know, they used to call us in that in that phase. They used to call Hindus bows. Oh, bow! You know, how dare you hang out with this Sadarni? But you know, there was always that Sikh friend who came and said, "Buzz off." You know, I was a, I I took to smoking, uh, and you know, smoking in Punjab University in that era. Again, you know, in those times, oh, bow. But suddenly, you know, someone came and said, no, you know, so these permissions, these affinities, this fabric with held in Punjab, and that is why I think Punjab came out of it very quickly. Uh, mm-hmm. And Punjab is, I mean, we have no memory of it. We don't talk about it, except, you know, once in a while when we are romancing old moments and old times and old poetry and kind of, you know, reminiscing about those days. But really, I think uh, deep down, it didn't, it didn't percolate beneath the skin, unlike in Jammu Kashmir. Yes. Where I think the sustained phase of violence, where, you know, has played a certain nature of havoc, uh, a certain polarization. But I think uh, we were saved. Uh, and I would say that, you know, it was civil society, it was citizens, it was people, and it was the state also. It was a coming together. But Vivek, let's let's go into a slightly more difficult issue, which is the how we also found that, that, and we find this has repeatedly happened, that people who otherwise are not oriented to be violent or to support uh, uh, violence against innocent people in a moment of great uh, tension or a kind of a split uh, or a great trauma, uh, they tend to falter. So, for example, after Golden Temple uh, operation, Operation Blue Star, uh, though it became even more clear after the operation or during the operation that the Golden Temple was no longer just a temple. It was a heavily armed fortress, right? In fact, my most uh, painful memory of that period, building up to that moment, then that became the most painful moment. Then after that, the uh, Indira Gandhi post, Indira Gandhi assassination violence became the most painful period. Is the murder mm-hmm. of the police officer Atwal yeah. on the steps inside the Golden Temple where Golden he Temple. went to pray he yeah. was a sick and yet he was murdered. So, yeah, how do you process this? That so after Golden Temple, lots of my sick friends were not willing to look at the issue with any kind of clinicality or objectivity. And yeah. they were against the operation. And in reverse, at the time of the uh, carnage or the attacks on six in Delhi and other places after Indira Gandhi's assassination. The same thing happened in reverse. Any number of Hindus Worse. were sympathetic, were making excuses for the most okay, or you know, the worst scenario was an editorial in a leading newspaper which said, Oh, you know, wanting to slap a sick was understandable, but burning them alive was too much. And, you know, that was, in a sense, the first political crisis of my uh, life. I was in my mid-twenties at that time. How do you process this? How do you deal with this uh, way that people become vulnerable? Otherwise, good people who in their daily life will not go around beating anyone or even troubling an animal um, tend to become... Uh, leaning towards violence in a time like this, how do we how do we process this? Yeah, I think uh, fundamentally, you have to look at look. I mean, you have to look at beyond politics. What are we as as a form, as a nature's form? Uh, See, if you ask my wife, and if you know, if I claim here that I, you know, in, in front of Rajni Bakshi, that you know, I'm an epitome of Ahinsa, you know, I'll be kicked. I'll be kicked for life. 
See, I have I have intellectually, emotionally, try, intellectually made an effort. Emotionally, I'm trying to wear that glow. Have I succeeded? No. Because my deep, you know, DNA, you know, my core is that survivor, that reptilian. Now what happens is that fundamentally as a, as, as a society, as a human form, we are all works in progress. We are able to either straddle both or straddle neither. And I see a fundamental dysfunctionality in us as a society. Of course, I see the West has sanitized itself. Uh, you know, West has kind of created a police or a militaristic power, which is stronger than the citizen. So therefore, the citizen will think four times before becoming, you know, resorting to her, his core nature. But here, I think my core nature is alive. Uh, my core nature can express itself without any punitive fears. So I think what was happening is that as a Hindu, I was totally at ease with my Sikh friends. As a Sikh, my friends were totally at ease with me as a Hindu in that phase because we were young people, we were unformed. But I saw the adults were not comfortable. My father was swinging both ways, having the best of you know, his drinking buddies among six. The six were not able to respond. They were carrying a collective guilt. It took a bit of time, a bit of healing, a bit of crying together, a bit of drinking together, a bit of accusing without articulating it. I'm saying, how does healing happen? Fundamentally, the healing process has to be allowed to be because there are no systemic healers. There are no, there are no, you know, shrinks that are available to heal the collective psyches. So what heals is the fact. See, today, I do not go to the Golden Temple. I do not like that place today. But I grew up going to the Golden Temple. Because today, Golden Temple has become like a temple, like a Hindu temple. It's not that free space. It's not that uh, space where, uh, you know, I have tried a classic experiment for the last 20 years. I wear a Muslim skull cap when I used to go to a Gurdwara. Because they wanted me to cover my head. So this was these were my own experiments. Today, if I wear a skull cap in a Gurdwara, they will tell me to remove it. You know, uh, Bhanu, my wife, she did this, uh, took the water from and she did that towards the, you know, sanctum sanctorum. And uh, Babaji comes and says, you know, don't do these Hindu practices. This is not a Hindu place. So I'm saying the same temple that I rejected. But I was able to go to a golden temple. All my life, I do not go to golden temple anymore. It's a loss for me because Sikhism is becoming like Hinduism, driven by Hindutva today. So there is a shift that is happening. You know, we should have evolved into more easy people because we were fundamentally easy people. But a certain tightness, there is a certain anger, there is a certain looking over each other's shoulders uh, that is beginning to happen in our collective, you know, nationhood and identities. And uh, so there's a, so there is that, that something which causes an irritation today, which yeah. didn't exist. And we transcended the violences very easily. Uh, without a problem, but I don't know how to transcend the fact that I have lost Golden Temple. I will not go there because I do not go to a temple because in a temple as a 10-year-old, you know, the priest hit my hand because I, I, I presented my left hand for the prasad and he hit my hand like this. I said, Vivek Sharma. 
तुम ब्राह्मण हो तुम्हें यह भी नहीं मालूम है यू टेक प्रसाद विद द राइट हैंड नॉट विद द लेफ्ट हैंड लेफ्ट हैंड इज फॉर द डर्टी जॉब आई थ्रू द प्रसाद आई मीन दैट्स वन ऑफ द सिग्निफिकेंट इवेंट्स ऑफ माय लाइफ आई थ्रू द प्रसाद एंड नेवर वेंट बैक टू इट my mom my mom was an amritsar girl i kind of you know all my childhood went to amritsar with her so i would always go to amritsar i would sit by the you know the outside the sanctum sanctorum i remember my mother she died a little young uh, so you know i had an emotional thing with but now it's like i wouldn't i wouldn't go to a ashi vishwanath or a uh, no blah 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 uh... so we make that is a uh, very beautiful what what i'm hearing you say is that this ease with each other this organically rooted uh, love and affection or sense of connection across uh, the differences in our approach or in our faith that to you is the essence of ahimsa if i'm understanding it correctly now with this framework what does it mean for you to be the program director of the gandhi fellowship if we can shift to that because i think first you will have to also walk us through very briefly because many people who will watch this will not be familiar uh and this is work that is now i think in its 13th or 14th year so it's in itself a very rich a uh, body of experience and both for you and the people you have worked with the fellows who passed through the program so can you a tell us what is the program about what it aims to do and how does ahimsa feature in the work you all do with the fellows so uh i think uh, i don't know who to owe my debts to uh, and uh, i think uh, these are very interesting times uh, you know today change is possible three years ago when i started my life my career i think uh, the, the space for change was did not exist the political masters were a little bit of rent seekers they didn't believe that there was a possibility of citizenship coming forth and telling them you know what to do what not to do but i think there is a very interesting constellation uh, that has appeared uh, a political constellation and i am saying that the samaj the bazaar and the sarkar you know i think they've been they've gone through a churn uh their own churn their own existential churn uh i think samaj is now able to ask uh you know is able to look into the eye of uh, power there is a certain empowerment that has happened uh i mean the ambedkar saab's vision i mean i see beautiful signs of that uh so i'm saying that there is one is that aspect so it's a very interesting time when it is possible to negotiate spaces now what are the spaces that we negotiate fundamentally i am saying i i grew up in a minor privilege not a great privilege but a minor but what did i get out of 20 years of education it was just four good teachers in 20 years those four good teachers and i have i have spoken to hundreds of young people they do not get a single good teacher in their life i mean you come to a delhi university you might in the political science department find a particular good teacher but are the teachers contributing to your creation so how do you how i mean these 20 years are the best years this is the time when i am learning to be to negotiate to learn to fly to kind of you know create a future and i don't get any inputs in india it's a traversity so we, the question in our head was how do adults learn and we found that adults learn by themselves they don't need a teacher 
you learn i mean people like us who didn't get good teachers we learned outside the class was i deficient of course my shrink later told me yes you are deficient but that's another issue uh but we created our own learning programs we learn to learn and now when you actually i mean go through the process of how learning takes place it is not incumbent on a master teacher anchor adult facilitator so we said if india is going to be a poor country our degree colleges will never have strict degree colleges do not have a good teacher fundamentally the great institutions the presidencies the you know ferguson's the stephens the zavierites probably still have some notion of uh, you know goodness in their teaching frameworks fundamentally these institutions have gone to dogs they are not the exalted institutions today that they used to be so we said how do we create a pedagogy where the adult is not required because there is a beautiful awkward looking for a different aesthetic kind of a young person but she doesn't know how to engage see in my generation the girls gave me attention because i was a contrarian but in this middle class isolation of the last 20 25 years there is no space for contrarians apne engineering nahi kiya to aapne doctor nahi bane aapne you know some of these so called uh, professions i mean then you are scum so in this how do you create a space where young people can create a learning what is called an andragogy a self driven program that was the question that aditya natraj my co-founder my founder uh, with whom i work and that was the aesthetic that we were exploring how do we create a program where there is a there is a sandbox there is a experimentation lab gandhi saab said they are hard say people who cannot you know toil with their hands are going to be fundamentally dysfunctional and now as we understand cognitive sciences we understand that we are only using a part of the brain so we said the kids who are not only so which are the kids we got into gandhi fellowship we said kids who are toppers we love toppers because that person has done rigor has done excellence outputted excellence after rigor but we don't like toppers alone we love young people who've done extra curricular rigor because somebody who's done bharat natyam played tennis played sitar has done that thing which is outside of the normal and then we love the gundas you know student union i did this i picked up five kids and i worked for them i changed the way you know i i mean my favorite example is that gujarati boy he said vivek i learned to be a barber because the barbers in my village were not cutting the hair of pellets i think this is i mean this is a gandhi this is the 25 year old gandhi now this nature of young people exist they are 2% in a college searching for them is the key and i actually went college to college to college and i asked students which is the good professor good professor does not mean reading uh, papers and writing books which is the prof that loves you which is the prof that gets you outside class which is the prof that will listen to you will uh, allow for your you know erratic uh, unformedness to show up and you know allow it to play and i found that you know there is a prof in calcutta university economics department there is a prof and in presidency there is one teacher she has been trying she is looking for those good students now when i gave them the trust that give me your beautiful good students i have aspiration to create a leadership program where reading books is not central they're doing with their own hands we will create a laboratory of doing so gandhi fellowship program created what we call an action reflection pedagogy act and you reflect so we created this you know cohorts of five fellows and a supervisor through them in the indian backyard 
and allowed them to engage with the community allowed them to test their theories because delhi university you know girls angsty young women you know women's vi violence against women and when you go to rural rajasthan you realize there is violence it's not just of course women get the worst end of it but the dalit the, the poor the you know every one there is violent spirit and then you realize that in that violence there is beauty there is a kind of a energy a positivity there is an existence there is a whole ecosystem that blossoms within that women negotiate that violence and create their women's groups you know dalits are able to leave migration you know young people held that romance of you know gaon chalenge i said but gaon gandhi baba's gaon is not the gaon that you are going to today you know today villages have no men left uh, because they've all migrated uh and so we created this space where the rewiring of the mind happened the first semester and gandhi baba did not work to a theory that was taught in a social work school gandhi baba said you know karke dekhte hain shayad fail honge maybe we will succeed. because he's not he's never exposed you know finding of truth his life is a i mean for me gandhi fellowship program named after baba gandhi is because it's a journey it's a lifetime of experiments with the journey of truth seeking mm. with failures revisions academia post facto can write reams but he was not he didn't bother yeah so i said how does a 25 year old how does a 22 year old make her experiments so we coded two programs 8 am to 2 pm we said he'll give you a finite problem to solve you will work as assistants to five government school headmasters so you monday go to one school tuesday go to another school wednesday go to another so you work help these government school headmasters 25 year old help a 55 year old solve her problems uh so that was 8 am to 2 pm 2 pm to 8 pm you got access to these five schools go to these i uh, five communities around these schools go to these communities and solve a problem and these young people created such beautiful havoc such <laughs> such a orientation from the heart which we call now seva bhav so they worked out of seva they worked out of passion they did not work like activists of course there was a there was a metal that was that needed to be broken uh the, the masculinity the patriarch but then often enough you you didn't go you didn't go you know lock horns with them you lock horns with them but you also created negotiated your spaces because the competency that we were trying to teach was influence without authority see the beauty of gandhi saab is that he never had power in he had he never took power of a seat a position he just negotiated his spaces of course he held the imagination of india but that's a 50 60 year old gandhi what is the 25 year old what is the 30 year old what is the 35 year old it's teamwork it's influencing it's engaging it's working with the other the indian college system fundamentally you know asks you to create excellence within your own flock yeah that's history what i was history wale, thinking history wale, that that doing this against all odds yes surviving being fearless and being fearless is for a woman to live in dharavi in may in the communities i'm saying you know i can do a i can do the gandhi fellowship in a rural area i will just enjoy but imagine the girls and the boys young men and women who did their fellowship in bombay dharavi in surat in amdavad in slums where to you where do you go to the box how do you solve i mean how, the menstruation issues how do you solve for yourself and how do you talk to the women now these issues rewire your head 
and you see that there is the other the amma who fed me my favorite example rajni is i was going on a selection so the selection process of gandhi fellowship was used to take them in the slums in the south calcutta slums i was doing a three day selection process and my fellow i mean these candidates from calcutta and uh, near about other uh, places vishwabharti you know it kadakpur all of these young people they were going in the slums and i smelled amazing fish and i started to follow the aroma of machhi and i arrive at the window of a shanty and there's an old shriveled woman who's frying fish and i am peeping into her shanty from that uh, window or that stone uh, corner and she you know invites me in and she has some three four pieces of fish and you know i i mean give me good food and you know the, the person offering me food will fall in love with me because i love you know and she offers me a piece of fish and i have that most ecstatic eating of that fish that the woman loves me old woman loves me and offers me a second piece i relish the second piece now i need to go i don't know how to go like a stupid urban guy i take out my wallet and i offer her a 100 rupees this is 10 years ago rajni can you imagine what that woman did she slapped me now you know this is how wrong we can be sitting in our headquarters in delhi and uh, state headquarters our imagination of transformation is so wrong what we need and what we want to serve and what they need is very different i did a very interesting uh, experiment so when i used to travel into the hinterland and i travel to the hinterland extensively again inspired by baba gandhi i said this is my traveling i mean i love to travel uh, and this is my journey into the you know hindustan that i don't know hmm. and i used to do an experiment i used to say mujhe diksha mein jana hmm. and my local district coordinator invariably male had organized the friends hironda ke vivek sir aaye hain And back then, uh, विवेक सर आए हैं तो थोड़ा हीरो होंडा कर लेते हैं और एक कैब हैड बीन अरेज आई नेवर पेड फॉर ए कैब बिकॉज आई सेट यू नो इट्स वेस्ट ऑफ मनी थ्री थाउजेंड रुपीज टू थाउजेंड रुपीज पर डे इज ए वेस्ट ऑफ मनी आई कैन स्मॉल टाउन आई कैन बी इन ए रिक्शा ऑटो रिक्शा सो माई डिस्ट्रिक्ट कोर्डिनेटर यूज टू बी एम्बेस्ड के सर वी ऑर्गेनाइज अ मोटरसाइकिल फॉर यू एंड यू आर यू नो यू वॉन्ट ए रिक्शा और ए टोंगा the second experiment that i did was that i used to say at where do you get good golgappas or a chaat and they'd be they'd be like you know okay now boss is asking for this so we have to serve get him chaat but they wanted to eat hamburgers i mean burgers you know rural india burgers a bun and some tikki inside and they wanted to eat chowmins while i wanted to eat chaat and they were embarrassed that i wanted to stand on the road and eat while they wanted to sit on a table and eat so i am saying the aspirational curve there is an asymmetry so the fellowship because we as an organization were learning from these young people so we were not telling these young people do this to that we were watching these young people do experiments we were simulating their successes and their failures and debriefing the successes and failures my masculinity got challenged because if rajni succeeded i didn't succeed i'm a stephanian and she is like she doesn't even know hindi she's a bombay girl how does she succeed in rural rajasthan because rajni has an empathetic ear rajni is listening rajni is left you know actively listening as i am coming with a formulation oh aise you know we'll change aisa karenge to aisa ho jayega so that shift that learning that i acquired over a period of time listening to rajni how she succeeds how she is able to deal with that male headmaster who cannot deal with female teachers 
how Rajni is able to non-violently reorganize that space. Mm, mm, mm. So adults learn from themselves, among themselves. That's what I was just saying. That, that seems to be the most profound element here that I think uh, all you and the team that brought the fellowship together perhaps created a space. Uh, uh, aapne, you laid out the dari on which this process of self-discovery was possible. Absolutely. Do you want to say anything here about Ajay Piramal's role in funding the whole thing and anchoring it in an institutional way? You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing how Mr. Piramal is not a funder alone. Mr. Piramal is a is a is a is a deep heart. Mr. Piramal did not give his personal money before CSR came into act came into play. Mr. Piramal opened his entire repository of his advisory groups his understanding of spirituality to us because he's deeply seeped in the Gita. And he's, I mean, that's, that's where he derives his, you know, way of doing business from. So he's been a coach. He's been a mentor. He's, you know, his managing committee used to say, you know, when Aditya and I used to go to meet him and he used to meet us very often. And he used to say that you are my social business. You create social profits for me. So I will run you with the same business rigor. But you will create social profits. Define social profits. You know, and we used to tell him, you know, sir, it's not working. And we used to be scared in the early days. Because kuch hoi nahi tha. There was some only anecdotal evidence. There was no database evidence that, you know, change is happening. And he used to tell us, stay at it. Seva bhav ke saath kaam kare. Just allow good intention, good work. The, the source of good work is good intention. Now, in our classic degree training, my training from the left, I'm a reformed lefty. Aditya is a reformed capitalist. Both had no understanding of this language. Because the social work language was not this. Social work language was either angsty activity or anti-state or working in silos. He said, business is scaling up. You have to scale. And he punted on us. When the first batch of 100 fellows, everyone told us, you've created a human lab of small number of young people. It's an intense process. It's not a scalable process. Both Aditya and I said, if it cannot be, if it cannot be scaled, we will not pursue it. Because India is a scale problem. It's a large problem. I don't so how, many, a... how many fellows now, 13 years later, total? Approximately. Uh, with all with all humility, you know, uh, Rajni, I mean, the first batch of fellows in 14 years was 11 fellows graduated. And the last batch is 650 super bright, the best children from across the country uh, who show up into the fellowship. You know, it's these beautiful young people and these beautiful young people do not come from English speaking backgrounds alone. My one third cohort is people who were schooled in English and who went to a good college. My second most beautiful cohort is small town kids who studied in small schools, even government schools, but ended up in good colleges. And my third most beautiful cohort is kids who had rural schooling and rural colleges. So now see, you know, this Xavier Stephens boy and girl is hanging out with this rural young person. So, you know, Christine Gomes and Uday Singh Tundavat, they coexist. They learn from each other. They inspire each other. Because Christine doesn't know how to work at the bottom, but Uday does. 
but Uday does not know how to consolidate which Christine learned. And that is, and they ride together in their on their scooties and motorcycles and get into the communities and solve small little problems. I think big. Mm -hmm. The big work is what we do as an organization. We go to the states, we go to the center, we go to MHRD and tell them this is possible. Yeah. Yeah. They just go and convene the villages and villages where, you know, it's beautiful. Uh, Mayan Tendon created this uh, poem with the children of a school in Udaipur. You know, hand pump ke tanki mein machli kyo nahi hoti? Now, this is real. Uh, you know? Uh, and that I cannot create sitting in Delhi. I'll be a very wise, smart intellectual if I do that. But invariably, I will fail. But because there is a young person who's solving a problem there, I listen to her. So, Vivek, this wonderful and successful and very rich journey uh, is happening at the same time when in the larger society there has been an upsurge of open expression of hatred and validation of violence. Uh, it is also being said in a rather loud volume that India has been made weak by nonviolence. And that is usually also connected with. Um, the argument that uh, Gandhi uh, was partly responsible, or if not entirely, for this uh, quote-unquote weakening. Now, in this atmosphere, how do you see the Gandhi fellows um, both struggling and striving? How are they responding to this? See, because you've told us a lot about the ways in which they are by addressing the structural anomalies and the structural violence and by in their everyday work um, finding ever new ways to live and practice uh, compassion and fellowship uh, that they are doing and yet i'm curious how they locate this richness of what they are directly able to do with this larger context. Hey, you've touched it, my it must, it must impinge on them from time to time. So I think I will not be able to directly answer because you've touched a very, very raw nerve. Uh, I think my, my understanding is that Mahatma Gandhi's next project after 47 would have been the imagination of an Indian secularism. And I have a feeling that he was killed because of that. Because he was trying to create not... See, my secularism comes from atheism. I was first trained in atheism and then I became secular. But Indian secular... So the Western secularism needed to be contextualized in the Indian tradition. And I think Gandhi Ji was the best victim of that, where deeply seeped in his own Hinduism, he sought the other, he recognized the other, he participate, participated in the other's practice and their aesthetic. Now the problem is that that project, because of his assassination, did not reach fruition. And what we got was a Western secularism. See, I think, I, I think the fundamental beauty of Ahinsa was the farmer's protest. The fundamental beauty of Ahimsa was the CANRC protests. But there is a problem there. I requested the farmers. I requested the farmer leaders whenever I got an opportunity. I said, do not make it a sick protest. Keep it a peasant protest. 
keep it a farmers protest but the problem is that most farmers were six most first protesters were six and their primary identities was their sikhism and that got expressed in the gurdwara energy the langar now in my opinion langar is completely secular it's an indian secularism because langar is an expression of baba nanak who predates guru gobind who creates the khalsa now the problem is similarly cnrc they it inherently became a very strong muslim expression it was not secular so the problem is that our super identities of our religion make it a significant expression that we offer to the problem is with young people they are asking me about the gandhi fellows i am saying please do not embark on a journey of your experiments with truth the problem with an ma program is that the professor is passing on her ideology her now her ideology is a dogma to a young child a young person because it's not a lived reality of that young person it's a you know when i was given the communist manifesto i had no understanding of how society operates but if i have lived for 2 years and then i am reading the communist manifesto then i am reading multiple texts and i am talking to rajni bakshi and i am interacting with a mr piramal and his uh, you know nature of uh, mentors and coaches now these dichotomies help me rewire they help me look for my truth because it actually creates a mess in my head but when a professor tells you this is the book this is the this is what truth lies this is like dogma this is living by the book then there is no experiment and i have arrived at the truth so i think that is the that is the that is the journey yeah that young people some young people and i think history of social transformation is it is always some people some cherry picked young people who have caused these transformations true uh, so the 90% debate is of a particular language of a particular decibel a particular anger yeah. 10% are expected to behave differently respond differently uh, is our kind of you know aspiration and our kind of uh, theory of change so to say बिल्कुल सो यू नो इन हिज अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन गोपाल गांधी जी एम्फोसाइज द पॉइंट दैट ही इज सो ग्रेटफुल दैट देर इज नो मैन्युअल फॉर अहिंसा एंड गांधी जी मेड नो ही हैड नो इंटरेस्ट इन लिविंग बिहाइंड सम काइंड ऑफ यू नो एक्शन लिस्ट सो इन दैट स्पिरिट विवेक इन क्लोजिंग इन काइंड ऑफ रैपिंग अप हियर वॉट गिवस यू होप बिकॉज यू आर क्लियरली you have a passionate i think positivity about the journey of our society maybe the whole see, Rajini, one thing is that ahimsa is, is not an art for ahimsa see ahimsa is not an artifact correct uh but unfortunately ahimsa becomes an artifact when i go to you know when i travel to amdavad i become very nervous uh you know the sabarmati walas i mean they have a certain language they have a certain grammar so my thing my point is that ahimsa is a is a aesthetic it's a it's a quest it's a journey it's not a playbook so jo dalai lama bolte hai na ek compassion creating compassion over two generations will make fundamentally heal society so the pedagogy of compassion uh if it his theory of change is very interesting he says for two to three generations pain young people in compassionate processes and society will heal and transform i mean that's the so i'm saying 
so there is a kind of a north star that i see from uh, you know gandhi baba and uh, what gopal gandhi has said but what dalai lama says because compassion fundamentally requires empathy empathy requires listening listening requires a quietude a reflection and reflection is a training yeah. see the noise that exists today social media and everything you know so i'm saying that getting young people to quieten to do a vipassana to do a reflection to get into silences because all significant products that have transformed the planet are products of reflection i'm hoping my hope is that young people adults i have no hope i have no hope in myself i do not understand you know the digital world of tomorrow i do not understand cryptocurrencies i do not understand the whole range of phenomena but these young people a collection of young people some working in the grassroots some in the bureaucracy some in politics somebody in wall street this network this warp weft of young people this coalition when it comes a potent force 10 years later 20 years later when they become decision makers and they do end up becoming decision makers when they grow up i think that's a chance and hopefully there is a pedagogy of compassion which we subscribe to uh at least some parts of the planet subscribe to because you know we also have a problem we are not first movers i mean we should have been the first movers given the you know collection of knowledge that we have age old knowledge that we have but we are unfortunately getting all of that and you know then it will come down from the west and we'll accept it uh but young people is the hope uh and empathy compassion nurturance because you know work issues of peace issues of climate cannot be solved otherwise no bilkul uh so thank you so much for sharing your rich experience thank you rajini